Nowhere in the scripture does it teach that you had to search and pursue happiness. You find happiness as you do your duty. You find happiness as you lead a disciplined life before God. Nothing else can fill it. Marriage can't fill it. Drugs can't fill it. Sex can't fill it. Alcohol can't fill it. But the person of Jesus Christ can fill it. Well, good morning, church. I'm so thankful for men like Billy Graham who carried the banner of not only the gospel but biblical truth for decades. And this morning as we begin an overview in our time in the book of Philippians, I think that statement he just shared pairs so perfectly with the theme and the intent of the content that is known as Philippians. So if you have a Bible, I want to encourage you to uh, grab it and open up to the book of Philippians, or if you have a mobile device by which you may access the scriptures. Um, this morning, we, we begin a 12-week journey through this book, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. And I'm really looking forward to the fall, not because solely will we hopefully be relieved of a little bit of the heat and humidity that we enjoy as Northwest Floridians. Um, not only is it because I, I don't know about you, but I, I would love to kind of have a sense of relaxed shoulders when it comes to the storm season of the Gulf. Um, generally, the fall and winter don't bring that kind of uh, vigilance that's necessary to watch the Gulf of Mexico. Um, but I'm looking forward to the fall, not because I'm turning 40. That's supposed to happen in the fall. We'll see if I make it that far, but um, not looking forward to that. But uh, I'm looking forward to the fall because of you. Um, we have this opportunity this fall to gather together on Sunday mornings to worship Jesus. And we'll do that in song, as we just did moments ago. We'll do that in our giving, in our serving, in our fellowship, and taking communion. But also hearing, learning from the book of Philippians. I'm looking forward to that. I don't know about you, but I, I benefit personally from gathering together to worship Jesus. Because much of life, at least the culture that we're in, is presented as you're the center of attention. I'm the center of attention. And when that's the constant message, I don't know about you, but it's a bit exhausting to kind of live for self. So I love to gather with God's people to be reminded, oh no, by the grace of God, life's not about me. It's about Him and about them. But also, secondarily, not only will we gather during the fall, but we'll group together. We'll, we'll gather to love and worship God, but we'll group together to connect. Why? Because we, we can't think of anything better to do. Like, we don't know what to do. No, 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 no. Um, the early church did so. They gathered in the temple and they grouped in houses and in different communities for fellowship, for the application of God's Word. This fall, we have the wonderful opportunity in our gatherings and in our groups to learn so we can live well. You know, the letter to the church that's in Philippi is truly one of the most tender-hearted letters Paul ever authored. Some of the most treasured verses in all of the New Testament come from this tiny little epistle. If you have your Bible, look at verse 6 of chapter 1. And I kind of like this morning, it kind of feels like I'm a preacher of old without a microphone. I have to kind of shout over the rain, which is like, okay, I need to engage or else you're just going to like, this is such beautiful weather to fall asleep to at the moment. So I'm going to do my best to stay as engaged as possible. And we're going to pray that the power stays on, because I've heard in Gulf Breeze proper, it, it did go out a little bit. So this is an exciting morning. We'll see how it goes. Verse 6 of chapter 1, look at what Paul writes. He who has begun a good work in you will probably not see it through to the end. No, he who has begun a good work in you will what? Will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. Verse 21 of chapter 1, look at what Paul writes. For me... To live is Christ, and to die is gain. Thumb over to chapter 3, look at verses 13 and 14, where he writes, Brethren, 
I do not count myself to apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Your past doesn't own you. That's a beautiful truth. We can all move forward. Well, look at chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. This is a verse for many of us that we have highlighted and underlined and hanging on our walls in some sort of text art. But Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 through 8, be anxious always because there's so much to worry about. No, be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Look at Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. I can do some things through my own efforts. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I don't know about you, but these, for me, are food for my soul. This fall, we will be presented with this opportunity to learn so that we can live well. You know, one of the resources we're encouraging those that group together in sermon-based connect groups to pick up on Amazon or wherever books are sold is this little Bible commentary known as Be Joyful. It's an application-based commentary. It's, it's, it's a, a collection of writings and notes from an individual by the name of Warren Wearsby. And it gives small group application questions. And in fact, as you journey through the book of Philippians with us, though we won't be preaching Warren Wearsby, we'll be preaching the Bible, we're going to follow the same outline that he outlines this book. But he says something about Philippians. He says something about studying the Bible that I thought was so interesting. Let me read to you what he says. He says, the best thing about Bible study is not the learning, but the living. That the purpose of what we're doing today is so that you would own this truth. Jesus is the key to joy. I'll never forget that statement. I can't remember if it was my little brother or somebody who said this, something I read, but someone was going to a women's Bible study or a men's Bible study or a teen Bible study, and he said, hey, when's the test? You sure do study a lot, you know? It was like this mindset of like, is this what we do? We just learn, learn, learn? No, we learn so that we can live well. That's the purpose of why we've gathered this morning. So you have to lean in when the sermon is being presented. Why? Because there is a tendency to lean back and go, yeah, that's cool. Man, where's the story? Where's the tweet that I can just, where's the entertainment? But see, church doesn't exist for entertaining. It exists for training. Training so that we may go out collectively into our worlds and make disciples. That's the purpose of the church gathered. That's the purpose of the church grouping is that we would go. We gather and we group so that as we go, we can be encouraged. See, we have an opportunity each week for the next three months to hear this beautiful truth proclaimed. Jesus, he's the key to joy. We have this opportunity for the next three months to group together and dialogue about this truth and see it worked out and worked into our lives. But Jesus, he's the key to joy. Joy is central to this little epistle. You say, what's an epistle? It's like New Testament language for a letter. You could think of this as an amazingly long, calculated text message, if that's helpful. But this is the text message from Paul, if you want to look at it that way. It's just a letter. Remember, anyone ever written a letter, like with pen and paper? The new generation. Some of us may, I never even know what that is. Okay, yeah, you know what a letter is. Well, at least 19 times in these four little chapters, the words joy, rejoicing, 
or gladness are mentioned. So I thought, well, what does that mean? Like joy, how do you define it? I mean, I, I know a joy. There's one sitting right there, but is it a name? I mean, what is joy? I like what one author said. He said, biblical joy, listen to what he says, is choosing to respond to external circumstances with inner contentment and satisfaction. Why? Because you listen to Bob Marley. Don't worry. That's why? No, no, no. Because we know that God will use experiences to accomplish his work through our lives. David Guzik, I love the Guzinator, the Sermonator. This is what he says. Joy is the exhilaration. Ooh, I like that word. What's that? Of being right with God and consciously walking in his love and care. Do you know what that means? You can have it. Joy is not for the select few who went to the right schools, who have the right last name, who are a part of the right political party, who were born in the right place at the right time to the right parents. Hear me on this. You can choose to be joyful or to not. Your temperament is your choice. This book will dismantle everything that you may use as an excuse, which you think is an explanation, to say, this is why I cannot be settled in my soul, joyful in my countenance. Paul will lovingly, but ever so skillfully, say, I'm sorry. You can no longer use the excuse of circumstance, people, things, or worry as a reason for why you're not joyful. You'll be given an opportunity to dismantle those mental bombs that go off. But it's just an opportunity. You must step into that by God's Spirit, in His power, to say, Jesus, what you say is what I say. May my mind be given over to you. See, in this book, Paul uses the word mind ten times, the word think five times. And if you add the word remember, there's a total of 16 times he's talking about your thought life. The secret of Christian joy is found in the way you think. Attitudes, beliefs, choices, decisions, the way you lead by example, friendships, goals, habits, interests, jokes. These are all an outflow of the way that you think. You've heard this phrase before, and I think it's very apropos and true. Outlook determines outcome. Wearsby, the author of this commentary that we're you know, saying, hey, yeah, check it out. It's a good resource. It's supplemental. It's not the Bible. There's only one book known as the Bible. But he says this about the book of Philippians. He says, Philippians is a Christian psychology book based on solid Bible doctrine. It's not a shallow self-help book that tells the reader how to convince himself that everything's going to turn out all right, but it's a book that explains the mind a believer must have if he or she is going to experience Christian joy in a world filled with trouble. Here's why I'm so thankful for this. Because I don't have to have a high IQ to have what God has for me. But I do have to have the right EQ. I have to be listening to what he's saying. And I listen with my head, heart, and hands. The things that I do define me, not the things that I just agree to or what box I check on a form that identifies me politically or, or something of that nature. But it's what I do which is an outflow of how I think. And may I see your eyes. Here's what I need you to know this morning. If we never get an opportunity to be in one another's presence again, be there in person or online, you have the ability to make the right choice. Please don't believe the lie that where you've come from or how you've been raised or what you've always been doing, that you are shackled to that. No, you are not. 
You can choose. If there's breath, there's possibility. You can walk in the fullness of, spirit, of the Spirit of God. You can experience peace with God and the peace of God. It's possible by what God has done through His Son, Jesus. And this morning, here's what I would like to do briefly with you. And I mean briefly because I know it's kind of gnarly out there and I'd like to not keep you here during a tornado warning. I don't feel like that's a great idea, but here's my thought. Here's my hope. Wearsby shares in this opening chapter in a way that I felt was just done so well this foundation of this truth that Jesus is the centerpiece of this little book Joy is the focus. The mind is the access point. So he shares at least four thieves. Do you know what a thief is? It's not like that like special spray you get if you're like worried about organic like cleaning materials, but it's like thieves. These are people that steal from you, want to destroy you, don't have your best interest at heart. There are four thieves to joy that he mentions. Circumstances people, things, and worry. These are mindsets or attitudes that you do not solve, but you balance, you manage daily. You don't ever like solve depression. Does that make sense? Like you balance it, you manage it. You don't ever say, listen, I've kind of like figured out how to not let circumstances bother me anymore. I'm good. Like, wait till Monday hits then, because the Lord will say, look, you're not, take heed lest you fall, right? Like, you stay close to the Lord. People say, oh, people don't bother me. Well, let me introduce you to something. I'll help you, I'll help you with that. Like, um, you know, like, no, this is, we're all still a work in process and a work in progress. So this is not the kind of thing that when you go Philippians, go, great, I'm finally going to learn how to do joy, so I don't ever have to, like, think about that again. No, 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 no. You don't graduate from the Bible. You never, like, surpassed Christianity 101, right? We're all in that together, no matter how long you've walked with the Lord. But he speaks about these these robbers, these destroyers, these, like, landmines that are set here that will destroy you and your potential and who you can be and should be in Jesus. I say, why is that important? Because he shows how the four chapters of the book of Philippians, slowly but surely, gives illumination of how to navigate circumstances, people, stuff, and worry. And I thought, well, thank God, because that's brilliant. I think that should be shared. So this morning, here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to share with you four attitudes, mindsets, and choices that we can step into in the positive and how to navigate circumstances, people, things, and worry because it gives us an outline of what we're about to step into through the four chapters of the book of Philippians. Shares four choices that we can make to balance and actively engage in joy in a life that's filled with the presence of Jesus. Father, I pray as we just consider these four simple things this morning that you would awaken our hearts to your truth and that I would be able to serve your people well. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Let me share the first attitude that Wearsby says in his book. We'll put it up on the screen. It's it's this first and foremost, that if circumstances are truly a thief of joy, one that will destroy this ability to have this exhilaration of soul that you know God and are following him, then what you need to choose is a singleness of mind. Say, what do you mean by that? Well, next week, Pastor John will open up chapter 1, verses 1 through 11, and will, in greater detail, dive into chapter 1, and even some of the backstory of what's going on in Paul's life, why he's writing this, where he's writing this from. I'll give you a little bit of like the cliff notes. It's not a good situation. Paul's writing from prison. <sighs> How many of you guys would love to be doing that? Like, no, like this is not a good situation. I'm in, I want to be there with the people. No, I'm writing from jail. And there's actually people surrounding him in his ministry that are benefiting monetarily 
and in publicity off of his unfortunate circumstances. Have you ever felt that way? God, I feel isolated, and I feel like people are benefiting off of my challenges. So Paul writes a book on how to have joy. (laughs) This is where he comes from. But his circumstances, please catch this, they don't rob him of his identity in Christ. His circumstances can't rob him of his joy because he isn't living to enjoy circumstances. Can I say that one more time? Why can't circumstances rob the Christian of joy? Because you're not looking to circumstances to give you joy. This is countercultural. Now I'm looking for the right circumstance. When do I graduate? When do I marry? When do I get the promotion? When does the home finally get built? When, do the, when does the storm go away? That's when I can have joy. Then keep chasing your tail. Because Christians do not look to circumstances for the source, source of joy. Paul did not look at Jesus through his circumstances, but looked at his circumstances through Jesus. 2019, 2020, 2021. Was there trouble? Yeah. Earthquakes? Yes. Pestilence? Yeah, I think that's called COVID. Storms? Uh, Yes. Wars and rumors of wars? Uh, Yes. So let's freak out. Or let's read the Bible. In the latter days... There will be pestilences, earthquakes, wars and rumors of wars, storms. So how does the biblical Christian interpret that which is happening? This is sad. Today there will be loss of life because of Ida. Nobody is thankful for that. Today there will be challenge. There will be sorrow. There will be death. Nobody appreciates the aftermath and the consequences of a sinful world. Nobody. But we know what's coming. We know what birth pains are. I do. My wife's been doing that six times. Nobody's like, oh, okay, she's got birth pains. Let's, all right, this is awesome. No. Everyone's like, hey, we're going to get through this. Like, we're still married. Like, I know you want to, you know, like, we're going to get through this, you know. And then when it's over, it's like, oh, we got through it, and look, there he or she is. There he or she is. How do you navigate that? A singleness of mind. Singleness of mind. When you have singleness of mind, circumstances work for you, not against you. So how do I do that? You know, there's this book called The Bible. And in chapter 1, let me show you how he outlines this for us. Verses 1 through 11, he says, My singleness of mine is on the fellowship of the gospel. That's chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. Chapter 1, verses 12 through 26, my my focus is the furtherance of the gospel. Chapter 1, verses 27 through 30, my focus is the faith of the gospel. See, Paul understood that his single purpose was to know him and to make him known. So when circumstances didn't go away that was comforting or pleasurable, he's like, it's okay. I still have joy. I'm not looking for heaven on earth. I can't wait to be in heaven. But this is earth. This is not heaven. This is not the final home. I'm just passing through. Circumstances, please listen to this. Circumstances were subservient to him, he wasn't subservient to them because of his singleness of mind. Say, that's not me. Let me ask you to make sure you fully know what the gospel message is. The good news of Jesus is that he was sent from heaven by a loving father to die your death and to pay your penalty and to break the power of sin in your life so that you could be free to help others know that same power and that same truth. You're free and you've been given purpose. But you say, but I would like to 
do this or do that with my life. That's okay. God gives you, I believe, desires in your heart. Make sure they're confirmed and corrected through this. This is the sieve of that which your choices should and should not be. But God does not exist to fulfill your will in heaven on earth. Does that make sense? You exist to fulfill his will on earth as it is in heaven. And some of us say, that's not what I want. And just be honest. I don't want Jesus to be Lord. I just want him to be Savior. Well, that's not salvific faith. That's still an egocentric lifestyle where you are living for you, where comfort is king, and you live in a culture that feeds you that all the time. Can you navigate circumstances with an egocentric life? No, you can't. Because you know why? The world doesn't exist for you. Things are going to happen to your agendas and goals and plans and wishes and hopes and dreams that may thwart them, that may change them, that may kill them. But here's this mindset. But Lord, my heart is you. And my heart is to see you do a great work. So if circumstances change, it's okay. Because this is still going to happen. You're still going to be glorified. People are still going to hear about you. Whether in life or death, I'm good, Lord. I'm good. How do you navigate circumstances? Here's how you do it. You die. And your life is now hidden in Christ with God. See, adding Jesus to your life as a supplement is not only not the gospel, but it doesn't work. It doesn't give you a life of joy, peace, kindness, goodness, and self-control. It makes you miserable because you've believed a false gospel. You've been sold a bill of goods that if you just add Jesus to your life, but still it's your life, well, then the benefits of following Jesus are yours. That is not true. It's a surrender where I say, Lord, my singleness of mind is you. That's how Paul can write from a prison cell and joy just exude from his heart through his hands into his pen and write this letter. And listen to me. Hear me on this. May I see your eyes. This is what you're designed for. Jesus. To live for him. Where marriage is not the end goal, it's a part of your sanctifying process. Don't believe me? Ask someone who's been married for more than a year, right? We're children are not like, well, that's how I'll live my dreams, to that little boy on the team. No, no, no. I, I'm here to get to know that little boy or know that little girl and launch them well. And if there's someone like me, then great. But if not, that's okay. I steward them. I don't own them. They're not mine. They're his. Singleness of mine. And it's something you balance. But you say, okay, I understand the circumstances things, but, 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 but what about people? Like how in the world do you maintain joy with other humans that exist on this planet? Well, I like what Wearsby says. In chapter 2, he says this. He says that it's about a submissive mind. Submissive mind? People? Wait a second. I don't like those two words. Like people I don't necessarily get along with, and you're saying submission? Well, take your Bibles and... Look at me, with me in verses 1 through 3 of chapter 2. If you're there, let me know by saying Jesus is the key to joy. Okay, Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Let me just read the New Living Translation. This is what he writes. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Because you go, man, all this circumstances stuff is actually more about Jesus than me getting my circumstances solved. So chapter 2 is like, hey, is there any like encouragement here? Any comfort from his love? Any fellowship together in his spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other. Wow, that's a task. Loving one another and working together with one mind and one purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Thinking of others better than yourselves. People do not exist for you. 
You exist for them, to serve them. You know, last night as I was thinking through this concept, I just did a Google search on the benefits of serving others, the benefits of living for others. And all these secular articles, Time Magazine, research from different educational uh, studies came up on the benefits of living for others. That there's actually something hardwired within every semen, every single human being that there's actually more going on in the brain, the chemicals that kind of produce joy, that produce peace, that even produce a sense of tranquility when individuals give to a cause that is greater than, than their own life or actually serve others. That, that your DNA, the way you're hardwired, is actually so that when you live for yourself, you're setting yourself up for misery, biologically. But then when you serve others, you do better. This is so interesting to me. This is what I find out about Christianity. Not only is it the right way to live, it's the smartest way to live. Like, this is the way God's wired me. But this is what he says. People, get along, serve one another, love one another, be kind to one another. Have a submissive mindset where you understand that it's not about you getting yours, but it's about him and about them. Have you heard that, is it called acrostic or acronym? J-O-Y, Jesus, others, and you. Acrostic, right? Well, listen. I'll never forget one of my Bible teachers said this, Neil. He said, Neil, in order for two people to get along, someone has to die. That's the only way it works. Someone has to die to pride, die to always being right, die to having it my way or the highway. There must be submission. Man, I wish there was someone who could give us an example of that. Oh, Philippians chapter 2, starting in verses 1 through 11. You know who he gives as an example? Starts with a J, ends with an us, and it rhymes with Mises. Jesus. He gives this wonderful example. Well, how do I be submitted? Look at verses 1 through 11. Jesus does it. Paul references his own life in verses 12 through 18 that he's being poured out like a drink offering. He talks about Timothy and Epaphroditus in this chapter as examples. Because the best way to learn is by example, right? He says, here's what it looks like to live submitted. Look at Epaphroditus. Look at Timothy. Look at my own life. Look at Jesus. How do you navigate difficult people? Moment by moment, second by second, choice by choice. But there's a submitted attitude. To who? Them? And I just do whatever they say? Oh, no, you're not an enabler of unhealthy people. That's not what I'm speaking about. I'm speaking about a submitted mind to Jesus. Say, Jesus, you own me. You tell me what to do. Tell me what to do. A submissive mind. Number three, you may say, well, if it's not circumstances nor people, what about things, right? Stuff. Well, in chapter three, Paul speaks about the spiritual mind. The spiritual mind. Eleven times in this chapter alone, the word things or concept of things is mentioned. Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, Beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Without proper precaution, the things you own, own you. Let me say that again. Without proper precaution, the nature of things is they will begin to own you if you don't steward them. It's not that you're this terrible, awful person if you're caught up in materialism. You're a human being who's maybe not weeded the garden today, you know, of your heart. I mean, this is just the nature of life when things come. Like somebody came to me a few months ago and said, Neil, I got a $100 short bus. Do you want to buy it? Yeah. Like a real one? Like not one from Tonka? Like a $100 like bus that I can drive? Yes. Well, sign me up. Where is it? And I look at that bus, and I took my son in it this week to get chocolate milk at 5.30 in the morning, because it was his birthday. And we call it the Pearl, 
because it's white and you know it's kind of like Jack Sparrow, but we're not going to paint it black. Cost too much money. It was a hundred dollars. I got to paint that thing black. But um, and my daughter was born the, the day or the day after we got it. Her name is Lainey Pearl. So I got Pearl's a good name. So my little two year old now he's three. Just had a birthday. Dad, are we taking the Pearl? He loves the Pearl. Every time we get in a different kind of vehicle, he goes, oh, the pearl, the pearl, the pearl. And this little three-year-old is caught up in materialism. He loves the pearl. It's got a hold of his little black heart, you know. And this is the, this is the thing. Like, if you're not careful, without proper precaution, the things you own will own you. But they don't have to. What do you mean? He gives at least three examples of individuals that have the right mindset. In chapter 3, verses 1 through 11, he talks about athletes and how they like just go for it with vigor. He talks about in chapter 3, verses 12 through 16, I'm sorry, first in verses 1 through 11, he talks about accountants, accountants that, that kind of uh, navigate things with the right values. Chapters 12, chapter 3, verses 12 through 16, athletes with the right vigor. And then verses 17 through 21, pilgrims, aliens, guests who have the right vision of life. He says, listen, if things are controlling, you have the right spiritual mindset. And then fourth and finally, chapter four deals with this powerful enemy known as worry. How do you navigate worry? A steady mind. In chapter four, which is filled with some of the most powerful promises of all of Philippians chapter, of the book of Philippians, Verses 1 through 9 of chapter 4, he talks about God's peace. Verses 10 through 13, God's power. Verses 14 through 23, God's provision. God's provision. Take your Bibles quickly and turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew. Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6. I want to read something to you from the words of Jesus. And there's always something to be worried about, right? Like I'm standing right above a skylight. And as I hear that rain, I'm like, man, I hope that whoever designed that did a good job or else I'm going to be electrocuted. Um, But Matthew chapter 6, verse 25, speaking of this thief known of worry, Philippians chapter 4, highlighting to us the presence, the power, the peace, and the provision of God. Well, listen to the words of Jesus about worry, starting in verse 25 of Matthew chapter 6. Jesus says, this is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food and drink. Enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns. But your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you more valuable to him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. Don't work And they don't make their clothing. Yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for the wildflowers that are here today and thrown in the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? Verse 31. So don't worry about these things. Saying, what will we eat or drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Let me say that again. Your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. So seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously. He'll give you everything you need. Don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. And we could say a rowdy amen to that, right? Today's got enough on its plate. Keys are an interesting thing. In this building, if you work here, you must keep this on your person at all times. There's a number of doors that have many different keys. 
Keys are an interesting thing. When I moved to the city of Destin to church plant, the uh, mayor gave me and a handful of other pastors a key to the city of Destin. I found that it doesn't do much for you, but it sure is nice to have, you know. It doesn't matter what kind of key it is. This kind of key, if you pay your bill, will let you into a gym that's 24-7. If you don't, and you get up there at 4 a.m. to work out and you forgot to pay your bill, you're bummed at this key. This key didn't do anything for you. Keys are interesting. They're symbols of opening and closing. Locks and keys affect our lives in various ways. Sometimes a key, listen to this please, sometimes a key means the difference between freedom and incarceration, life or death. Keys can give us security. They can lock a door that we want to be secure, or they can open a door. We have keys to our homes, belongings, suitcases, and cars, garages, hotel rooms, and log cabins, and even boats. And even when we're away from home, we're always carrying a key, most of us. Oh, we know where the key is. And this is what I want to say as we close our time together this morning. Jesus is the key. He's the key to joy. See, that's a great statement. How does that work? Well, I came up with an acrostic, K-E-Y. How do I have Jesus be the key? You must know him. You must know him. And that's not just a one-time thing. It's a daily. For me, it's like moment by moment. Lord, I need to know you more. I need to know you more. I need to know you more. Knowing him. Secondarily, though, it's engaging with him. See, this this fall, you will have the opportunity to navigate together as a community how to have joy in the midst of circumstances, difficult people, the ever-tangling tentacles of things in your life and worry. But you must engage with that truth in your head, in your heart, and in your hands. And you must constantly yield to him. That's how you have joy, in Jesus. See, you could look to some other God to give you joy. All a God is is the master passion of your life. You could look to salary or status or sex or substance or situation or stuff to say, that's going to bring me joy. And you'll always end up empty-handed. But once you meet the risen historical figure that actually lived, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, and yield your heart to him and begin to engage in a living relationship with him, and know that you know that you know that you know that you know him, then joy is yours. Because Jesus is the key to joy. But Jesus always has been and always will be the perfect gentleman. He's not going to knock down a door. He says, you got to open it. you got to open that heart. Open those hands. Open that mind. And let me be Lord. And here's the beautiful thing about the book of Philippians over the next three months. You'll be able to see tangible results as to whether or not heart, head, and hands are being yielded over to Jesus, engaging with him, knowing him. Well, how will I see? When circumstances hit, there will be an exhilaration of soul and a steadiness of mind. When people pull at you, you'll have this ability to have a serenity of soul when things may abound or not, right? That's what Paul says. I know how to have a lot, and I know how to not have nothing, and I'm good. Or worry. Does you think there's maybe anything that we could worry about today? Does it have to change your temperament? It doesn't have to. It's your choice. 
This is the life, in my opinion, you can have. A life full of love and joy and peace and kindness and goodness and mercy and self-control and patience. But the key is Jesus. How do I get to know Jesus? Well, start by knowing him. Confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord. Surrender to him. Begin engaging with him and his people. How do I do that? Gather with us on Sunday mornings to love and worship him. Group with us in connect groups to get to know one another. And then yield yourself to him daily, weekly, monthly, and until he finally calls you home. None of us know when that day or time is coming. We have no control over our dates, but an element of influence over our dash. No one can control the day and time at which you were born. And you're not intended to control the day and time at which you will meet Jesus. But your dash is now. Where is your mind? It can be settled. It can be submissive. It can be all these things that we speak of this morning, which in my opinion leads to joy. And Jesus is the key. So my hope and prayer as we begin this verse-by-verse study next week, we'll tackle chapter 1, verses 1 through 11, and then I think it's verses 12 through 14, and then 15 through the rest of the chapter or so. As we gather and as we group, you will have this wonderful opportunity to see the joy of the Lord be your strength. Because Jesus is the key to what, guys? Joy, yes, front row got it. Rest of you, good luck with life. But this row right here, they got it. Jesus is the key to joy.